and there are, I mean, creators that are making money on Twitch and some of them are making like a lot of money. I know from like subscriptions and the tips and all of that stuff. Um, is it, are musicians starting to use Twitch? Are there musicians on Twitch or people like actually playing shows and that kind of stuff on Twitch? Absolutely. So I, you know, I think Twitch has definitely had a reputation of being like a gaming platform, but in reality, it really is a live streaming platform. And Mm -hmm. there are so many different kinds of people, whether they're musicians or they're chefs or they're dance instructors who are making full-time living streaming on Twitch. Welcome to the New Music Business Podcast. I am your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business and creator of Ari's Take Academy. We are in very interesting times right now. Last week's episode, if you listened to that, was all about white musicians for black lives and what this movement is all about and what we can do as allies. It has been a challenge for me personally to see where I fit into this movement, this uprising that's happening right now. And I've been using my platform to encourage other musicians and people with influence, uh, namely white people, to use our privilege to stand up and support our black brothers and sisters through this movement. It's uh, I've been getting a lot of questions also lately on should be we be releasing music right now? And I've thought a lot about that because, um, you know, it's not even just releasing music, but what should we be posting on social media? Should we be promoting anything other than this movement. And I don't think there's really a right or wrong answer. I think everyone needs to do what makes sense for them. If you don't feel like attending protests are for you, that's okay. If you have more money than time, donate to organizations that are supporting black causes right now. If you don't have much money, that's fine. Then then spend time educating yourself. Read The Case for Reparations by ta Coates. Watch 13th, the documentary by Ava DuVernay. Now, There's a balance, of course. It is a lot right now. Taking in all of this information is heavy and challenging. Learn to take breaks, meditate, exercise, do some yoga, wind down with some mindless television. Everyone needs to refresh and rejuvenate. You don't need to stop releasing music or stop promoting your music or running your career, but find a way to integrate this movement into your daily life and your career, however it makes sense for you. Today's episode, uh, we recorded this uh, about a week before George Floyd's death. So we're not going to be mentioning this uprising because this was recorded before that. It nonetheless is a very important discussion. We talk about what it's like running our careers during COVID-19 during this quarantine, during shutdown. We hear from all the Ari's Take Academy instructors, including Lou Sidious, who's the instructor for streaming and Instagram growth. We hear from Vo Williams, who is the instructor for our Sync Strategies course. Kristen Math, she was the instructor for our Cracking Colleges course. And we also heard from Andrew Spalter and Allison Toy, and they're instructors for our Breaking China course out later this month. Everyone has a very interesting perspective from where they are and how they're running their businesses successfully during this shutdown and during quarantine and the obstacles that they have faced. As always, please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Like this, subscribe. Visit the completely revamped ariestake.com. You can sign up for the email list there and be notified about all future podcasts. Please review it if you are listening on Apple Podcasts. Let's kick into the show. Okay, cool. Welcome, everyone. Um, as people are starting to, to pile in here, uh, this is the first ever kind of full Ari's Take Academy roundtable discussion with all of our instructors. We wanted to, um, we thought this was a, a really good opportunity and time to bring in uh, the entire Ari's Take Academy community together. Uh, now that we're all kind of quarantined wherever we are all over the world, uh, we have such incredible communities that have been, um, you know, uh, fostering and growing within each course. And it's a beautiful thing to see, but we also wanted to bring everyone together 
uh, and kind of connect the community uh, under the ATA umbrella and just kind of show, you know, what is happening all over the ATA um, ecosystem. So yes, please, if you can, it would be really cool to see right in the chat box there where you're coming to us from. So where's everybody coming from? Columbus, Ohio. We have Jennifer Duda, uh, Bridget Boyle from Oakland, Angela from Chicago, Cooper and Joshua Tree. We got LA, Mark Orlando, Florida, Seattle, Durham, North Carolina, Arkansas, Paul and San Francisco. A lot of people from LA, Sarah Mendelson from Boston, Erwin, San Diego, Eliza, Allentown area in Pennsylvania. We got Solomon from the UK, London, represent. We got Miriam Ney, San Jose, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Moscow. We got someone from Moscow. That's awesome. Minneapolis, Patrick Irwin, what's up? Eliza, Santa Cruz, California. Uh, Virginia, Kevin from Herndon, Virginia. Sheboygan, Wisconsin. All right, my home state representing today. Um, cool, Canada. And uh, nice, Sophie. All right, so we got people from all over the world. Um, so let's... Um, Let's kick into it. I, I uh, Basically, what we're going to do today um, is we have all of the ATA instructors uh, with us here. We, um, I'm going to introduce each of them and, and kind of give their brief bio. Um, and we're going to kind of start, have a discussion about making music during COVID-19. How are people doing this? How is it working? Is it working? How has the landscape shifted? What does the future hold for everybody? And then after you hear from everybody, all the instructors, we will open it up for questions. So um, I'm going to start. Um, and uh, basically, so for those of you um, who can, you can kind of see my space here. Um, I am, I'm actually working on a record right now. And I was supposed to jump into the studio with my producer the week of quarantine, the week that that Los Angeles kind of got shut down, where the mayor came on and was like, yep, everything's closed and we had a stay at home order. Please don't leave. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, that puts a, a challenge on the whole operation. And we kind of uh, we put a pin in in starting the production um, and, and how I create like I'm a singer songwriter. So, uh, you know, I have traditionally made records with the full band in studio. I have a song coming out next Wednesday. Uh, and so when you see this song, um, I'll, I'll email everybody about it um, as well. And uh, of course, um, but when you see the song and there's a video that's releasing, it's a live from the studio video that we recorded last December with literally the entire band set up in the live room playing together. That's kind of the stuff. That's the way that I've made music in the past. That's why I love making music. And so that's why I thought I was going to make this, this record too. But now that everything has kind of started to settle into place, um, I'm now working with my producer. And what's really cool, how we're able to actually make this happen and work, is we're using a combination of Zoom, like this, uh, where he's at his studio, his place, I'm here. But then also, um, he he creates in, in Pro Tools, I create in Logic. Um, what we're able to do is there's this uh, plugin called Audio Movers. So if, those, if you're looking to collaborate with somebody from wherever, I definitely recommend Audio Movers. I think there might be a couple others on the market. I haven't looked into the other ones right now, but I, we're using Audio Movers. And basically what this plugin is, it works with Logic, Pro Tools, Ableton, and I believe Cubase. You can pop the plugin into the output of the DAW, and log in, send the link to your collaborators and they can listen to the session playing back in real time. So literally two days ago, my drummer is in his studio playing drum, or uh, sorry, the producer who's, who's also playing drums on the record. He's in the studio at the drum kit and I'm listening to the session while he's drumming, watching him on Zoom drum in real time. And then I 
after the take, I'm like, oh yeah, cool. Maybe, maybe hit the ride on the, on the third course, just head over to the ride. He's like, oh, great idea. I'm like, you know what? Let's not do the four on the floor over second course. Let's like save that to the final course and let's do a different kind of pattern. What if we did a pattern like do, 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 like try that kind of a pattern. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Got it. And then he did another take and we're doing it together. And it's like, we're actually collaborating, which is, and there's like magic that's happening. Um, and it's something that I was most concerned about. Uh, Jordan asked, are there any issues with latency? Uh, there's a little latency there. You can actually adjust the latency in audio movers. Um, so you, they, they'll enable it so you can kind of reduce that latency. And so there's those features there too. But yeah, like when he hits the, the symbol, I hear it like, you know, three seconds later. So it's not perfectly on. I'm not seeing it in, but it's, it's pretty, pretty close. Um, and it's cool because now we're like, we're still at the very early stage of this. We've done, I think, four sessions. And, you know, the first session, it took us, man, probably like two hours to just work out the tech stuff with it all. I mean, this is, uh, so if you're planning to do this, like just plan the first day to just work out all the tech shit because, I mean, it was like, oh, I'm hearing myself double. Uh, oh, well, this maybe this link is there and we got to put this in and the Zoom. Oh, mute your Zoom. Okay, now I'm going to use my talkback mic and we got... So there's like a lot of tech stuff dealing. But similarly, which is cool, you know, when I'm tracking vocals, um, I, so we did like all the scratch tracks where I laid down the guitars and the vocals. Um, you know, I don't, I know how to operate logic, but I really don't like tracking myself. I don't want to be my engineer when I'm trying to lay down a solid vocal take. Like when I'm trying to get into it and then work it, I don't want to have to figure out how pre-roll works on logics that will punch me in at the right bar and then jump back to the mic or have to get there to hit the R and run. So it's like what we're working with, that was my, one of my biggest concerns and fears was how am I going to deliver an impassioned, authentic vocal take that I'm proud of while having to deal with all the technical shit. And what we're able to do is through Zoom, my producer, I, can, I share my screen so I'm sharing my logic window. My producer uh, requests to take over my screen. That's a feature in Zoom, which I didn't even realize. He can take over my screen. And then I'm at the mic right here. I just got the, my little mic set up there. I'm at the mic and he's now running my logic on my computer while I'm laying down vocals and I don't even have to touch the computer and I'm there and it's, it's working. And that's crazy. And I got the talk back mic, and like everything. I'm hearing everything. So it's like I'm actually in the vocal booth and he's the engineer controlling it. So, um, and yeah, VST Connect allows also to play MIDI instruments remote in real time. Yeah, Enrico. So if you have other um, options that you've been using, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, like we've only been using audio movers, but I want to explore some of these other options. And I just think it's like really cool that this you know, it's, it has forced us and enabled us to get creative and yeah, sure. This thing happened. I could have sat back and be like, Oh, that sucks. Like, I don't know what I'm going to get to make my record. Like it's going to be another six months before we can see people. Well, you know, or we just like figured out a creative way. And believe me, I like, I love creating music with people in the same room. There's magic to that. And like, with especially with like song doctoring and songwriting and, and pre-production, there's like some of the creative energy and the magic that happens when uh, you're playing through an idea. It's like, oh wait, what if we went to this part and we did this on you know the third verse and we actually changed the chords? We're still doing that. And we're, we're having those magical creative moments, which I was like really worried we weren't gonna be able to have. And only by doing it, have I really realized that like, oh, this is possible and this can happen. So um, that's what I'm doing. That's how I'm making music during this, this quarantine session right now. And it's been really inspiring and really exciting. Um, and, uh, and I encourage everyone, shameless plug, to check out my new single coming out this Wednesday. But this just, as I said, this was recorded a few months ago. The, one, the music that I'm making right now won't come out for a little bit later. So anyway, um, all right, I wanna bring in some of our, our guests. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do here, uh, I'm going to read their bio and then we're going to chat a little bit and then I'll kind of move on to the next one. It's kind of like a panel discussion, uh, but more of a discussion discussion. So uh, our first guest is uh, Bo Williams. And hey. 
He's, uh, what's up, Bo? How's it going? <laughs> doing well, man. How are you? Great. So Bo is our Good. instructor for our Hip Hop and Sync course. Um, we just launched this course about six weeks ago. I'm going to read his bio real quick. Uh, Bo Williams is a Los Angeles-based rapper, singer, songwriter, composer, and performer. He's an architect and pioneer of the emerging genre dubbed epic hip-hop, a sound widely used in film. Growing up with a hunger for discovering new sounds and a love for creating has made Bo's sound a rich fusion of musical influences. His passion is to create iconic, powerful music with scale, vivid emotional tonality, and impact. Bo's music has been synced repeatedly by brands such as PlayStation, Mercedes-Benz, NBA, and UFC. His music has been heard in productions like Lethal Weapon, Empire, Ballers, and Atlanta, as well as in games such as Watch Dogs 2 and The Crew 2. Bo stands on the front lines of a revolution in hip-hop for film and TV while boasting a career packed with a list of achievements. Welcome, Bo Williams. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. I'm like, who is that guy? Yeah, right? <laughs> That's great. Nice. So I'm curious, what are you working on these days and how have your routines shifted and just kind of what's going on for you during this quarantine? And, you're, and where are you coming to us from? Uh, I'm in L.A. Okay, cool. So, so yeah. I'm in Los Angeles. What's, what's going on for you? Uh, man, I've been, I've been constantly working. Actually, um, you know, my part of the industry is really booming right now. Um, you know, we're witnessing a huge spike, you know, because everybody's home, of course. And our speculation is, uh, you know, with, with people logging into Hulu, Netflix, um, and other streaming platforms all day, just logging in hours, uh, ad companies are taking advantage of that, of that viewership. Um, and of course what happens when people produce ads, they have to sync it with music because there's, there's, it's very rare that an ad is not going to have any music. Um, so that means more work for, for musicians like us who work in sync and licensing. So uh, it's been insane, actually, uh, on my side. A lot of video game trailers, um, a, lot of, a lot of like interim trailers uh, okay. or, and, and television show trailers for stuff that's even on hiatus right now. But to keep the, the, uh, the hype about it up, uh, yep. they're producing even more trailers for that stuff. So... Um, yeah, it's wow. been great. And I, yeah, I've just been producing music, uh, collaborating a lot via Zoom. And um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been an interesting process, man. That's cool. So, so not only, uh, so you're, you're saying that like, you're actually securing syncs during this time period and that even oh, yeah. more so than, than normal? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. I mean, okay. I, yeah. yeah. Some awesome. of the weeks, <laughs> some of the weeks that I'm having, dude, like, like just, just for the sake of like, of sharing uh, in this group and the nature of this group. Like I typically don't like to talk about details of, of, um, of like how I'm like, how much my work is moving, like sales wise, you know what I mean? Like just in general, uh, but for the sake of this group, yeah. uh, because it's kind of like an educational community. Um, yeah. I've made somebody's salary a couple of weeks in a row. Wow. That's me. Yeah. Like a, like a nice salary. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So like things yeah. are actually coming through. That's, that's incredible. Um, and how are you, how are you creating, like when you're collaborating with producers right now, what's that process looking like? And how are you staying inspired? Like, are you waiting, like, are you working on just music that you're inspired by doing right now? Or are you getting briefs from like ad agencies or trailers or something like that? And then you hit up your producer and be like, let's make something like this. What does that look like? Um, man, really, it's a bit of both, right? So uh, I have songs cooking right now that are just based on, you know, what we think is coming and also how that mixes with how we're feeling right now. Okay. Um, you know, I always try to create functional music uh, and then I bring myself to that music, um, which is what produces, I think, the best product. I, I never really liked it. What do you mean functional music? What does that mean? Functional music. So uh, music that has functionality um, in terms of like, can you use this in your personal life? Can this, can this motivate you or get you through a challenging moment uh, yeah. on a personal level as a commercial release, but then also functionality to editors? Can editors take mm -hmm. this music and does it have the uh, sensibility to be applied to media? So, so I'm always considering the functionality of my music and I think having a purpose in that music, both uh, for the individual to be able to apply my music to their lives uh, and also for businesses to be able to apply the music to projects yeah. uh, is something that I, I consider heavily. Also in, 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 in that equation, um, right. you know, how is it functional to me and, and what am I expressing and what am I getting out uh, mm -hmm. through this music? So I love that. It's a very, um, 
it's a very selfless uh, way of producing music. And I, I think a lot of artists get very caught up in the, the ego and the self. And it's yeah. just like, well, if this makes if this affects me and if it's, it's uh, if I feel good about it, then it's good enough to put out regardless of how it's going to affect anybody else or if it can right. be anything else. And it's like, I was, I was sitting with um, on one of my podcast interviews, which is at my book signing with Andy Grammer, who's a singer songwriter. And he's this like, it's, it's not about you. It's about them. And yeah. it's like your music needs to serve a purpose. And are you serving Indeed. the purpose um, at enhancing people's lives? And how are you Indeed. encouraging them? And how, how are you inspiring people or giving, bringing them solace or comfort or anything? And he told this kind of story about how like he, he wrote a song that was really personal to him. And like he played it for his team and like he even like shed a little tear. It was so personal and emotional. And like the team was like, okay, I don't really get it. It doesn't really feel right. And like he realized right. and it was like, this song was really personal to him and it served a purpose for him, but it wasn't meant to put out because it wasn't going to really help anybody else. And it's really, right. when you think about it, like how, how can your music help other people not right. just help yourself? And like, you know, I'll be the first to say like last year, you know, I went through a, a breakup uh, just over a year ago, over a decade relationship and, wow. you know, I had, I spent the whole last year songwriting to process. And like a lot mm -hmm. of that was for me. Like I had to actually process that. I wasn't even thinking about putting that music out. And at the end of the year, I had like 40 songs that I had written. And yeah. I was just like, some of them were just for me. They will never see the light of day. Not for me. Right. But then I'm like, you know what? I got to the point where I got, I got past it. I got through it. I worked through it. I did the work. And I'm like, all right, I think I'm ready to maybe release some of this music. So then I picked the songs that weren't just meaningful to me because they all were, but also could help serve a purpose of others as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's such, it's such a great service that, to be able to do that with our music. Um, and for me, it also helps me feel, it also helps me to connect more confidently to um, the need for art. Um, which, you know, sometimes we can kind of lose that or feel like imposters when we have successful with success with art. Yes. Uh, but when we know that f at our core, I feel that we're creating something functional, um, not only to help ourselves, but to help other people. Um, mm. It can really help us like self-validate and empower our purpose and, and give us the confidence and the responsibility to produce. And it becomes less um, I feel like it becomes less stale in that way. So I've been really focusing on on making functional music in that way. And of course, again, the functionality also embodying the sensibility for editors to actually be able to apply this stuff to film and television, okay. video games, stuff like that. Love that. Well, Vo, thank you so much for that. We're going to bring Absolutely. you back in a little bit. Um, I'm going to bring in our, our, next, uh, our next instructor and then uh, we'll kind of all come together and, and have a, a, a nice roundtable discussion too. Um, Next one, we're going to bring in uh, Lucidius, and he is the instructor for our streaming and Instagram growth course. I'm going to read his bio real quick. Uh, Lucidius is an entrepreneur and hip-hop artist from outside the Washington, D.C. area. Currently located in Los Angeles, he has built a fan base in the hundreds of thousands and has totaled over 100 million streams across all available platforms. He has built his fan base and streaming growth with zero label investment, zero playlist placement, and zero outside marketing influence. Songs by Lucidius are streamed an average of four to five million times each month by listeners around the world. His music takes a strong stand on mental health awareness, personal struggles, struggles, and the pressure that many people face in our fast-paced, tech-driven society. Lucidius' third album, Enough, uh, was released last year. And uh, despite his focus on running an indie label, Lucidia's music, he has spent years mastering social media marketing and entered into the world of artist development. From artists of all genres and sizes, he has seen massive growth and profitability come to each artist who is willing to learn and invest. Lucidius, how are you doing right now? And, and like, what's, uh, what are your days like in, in your daily routines? And are you making music? And, and how's everything going? Yeah, so... For me, I'm actually, for over the last two weeks, I started getting a lot more creative. Okay. Um, I will say that, well, one, I've always written from a very personal place. Yeah. And my music is perceived to be dark 
from many, just just because of the sheer topics that I cover. Uh, I actually don't view it as dark. I think it's just deep. And then with a light twist, I always have like a positive shift in perspective on what I do. Yeah. But it's deep shit. It's yeah. heavy stuff, right? Heavy. And, um, you know, due to that nature, I have to go to those places sometimes to feel it. And even if I've gotten past it, sometimes I step back into old wounds to feel it, you know, maybe re-express something in a different way. And it's not easy to feel sometimes feel those heavy emotions. Mm -hmm. And I found my, myself through the first part of the pandemic, I mean, I got really depressed. Yeah. I, got, I got really fucking low mm -hmm. um, to the point where I created nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't even calling my mom back. Yeah. So like for two months, I'd say almost, uh, I had to really reassess and analyze what am I ignoring? Like, okay, I can't create right now. And even, even artists, even artistry itself wasn't really saving me because normally kind of like the functionality aspect that Vo's talking about, I use art for myself first and foremost to vent through what I'm struggling with. And then luckily a lot of people relate to it, mm. but uh, I, I wasn't even able to do that. So um, after, over the last two weeks, I've, I've really felt as though I've come out of that. Um, it was actually interesting. A feature request sparked that because I've only done two features in five years. What do you mean uh, feature request? I don't do features very often. Uh, I actually What's just asked, I, I just asked Vo like two days ago if he would feature with me because I think he's right. sick. But like first time in five years that somebody requested a feature and cool. I actually said yes. Cool. I really loved it. We just finished it a few days ago. We're pitching it to Universal Music and they work with like Fast and Furious and some other people. So really excited about that. And it just kind of sparked some, wow, okay. I can do this. Like I, I, every, every artist gets lost in their shit every once in a while. I got to take a break, but okay. here I'm back. I feel it. Um, and so a part of that, not only the feature, uh, it was just like my routine had to switch up. Mm. And uh, I recognized that I didn't have a sacred ritual for myself. And I started getting obsessed with social media and playing video games and watching movies and ignoring everything. So I was like, okay, I need to reconnect with my emotions. Mm. Uh, so I kind of, I kind of set time. I, I allowed myself to not have shame, and I was like, you know, all right, I'm not creating right now. It's fine. It's fine. We don't have to have extreme pressure on ourselves 24 hours a day. Yes. And I started. Uh, kind of, we talked about it in the podcast. I started meditating a little more. Right. And, uh, so my daily routine has been essentially more personal and like inner, inner reflective, and allowing the avoidance to dissipate and being like, okay, I'm going to sit in these uncomfortable emotions. I'm going to figure them out. I'm going to journal. Uh, and then I'll reapproach my art. Mm. And uh, I will say that's been very helpful for me. So I'm still working through it. I think all of us are yeah. dealing with a lot, but um, yeah, I'm definitely, I think I'm like five songs into my fourth album ish. Uh, wow. tying, off, tying off a few loose ends. I'm very fortunate and I live with my producer. We have a studio in our house. Uh, convenience. <laughs> uh, so like, <laughs> I understand that's not everybody's situation. Yeah. Um, but for five years, I was finding beats online and I had no producers and I still was making it work. So like, I'm very grateful for where I am. Yeah. Um, but even in the most ideal environment, I didn't even want to walk into the studio. I was like, open the door like it's like the dark decrepit part of the house calling my name saying come over here and write and i'm like no i don't want to today you know so i'm very i'm very uh feeling more grounded now mm -hmm. uh but it did take some like conscious awareness of stepping back and just recognizing all right i can't create right now i'm gonna give it some space mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. i think a lot of artists don't do that because we feel so much pressure all the time to yes. get content out content out content out to just to step back, take, yeah. a, take a break. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, it's, it's like, I think it's really encouraging uh, and helpful for everybody to hear this and to just also realize that like if they're going through something similar, we're all processing this in different ways. Uh, I went to the other extreme of, I started a, a, a live streaming music festival and I started, I was working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. 
like literally for the first three weeks of quarantine, I didn't stop working. And that's how I processed. That's how I went through it. I drove myself crazy fucking working all the time. And everyone's processing different. And that's not healthy either. Like I, I got to a point where I like, after like three weeks of that, I'm like, this isn't sustainable. I can't do this. And I just like shut down. And I had a day where I'm just like, nothing. <laughs> and I just like, I can't do it. And like, I, you know, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and you know, it's, it's um, recognizing and understanding uh, and, 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 and respecting your mental health is so important. And you talk about that a lot, especially in your music and how you address it. And, and so, you know, it's um, kind of hearing your journey, even just the last couple months of going through this and, and how you've been able to lift yourself up, creating the new ritual. Well, I like you, like you said that and, and new routines and, and focusing on meditation. And, you know, it's, uh, it's hopeful for, for, for us and for people that might be struggling with that. So, um, that's awesome. So thank you, Lucy, for sharing that. And, uh, we're going to bring you back in a little bit. Uh, yeah. so thank you. Thank you. Um, cool. So, um, yeah. And I like what, what Lennon said. Um, you got to recognize these things, allow yourself to take care of yourself. You've got to have gas in the car if you want to drive for sure. Um, cool. So our next, uh, instructor we have, and, and for the, uh, the speakers, the instructors, um, after this, if, if you do feel like you want to input anything, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and, and say something for the, for the attendees, hold your, hold your questions till the end. And we'll, we'll kind of come to that. Um, you at the end here. Um, all right, we're going to bring in, uh, Kristen math, Chris math. Uh, she is the, uh, student advisor for our cracking colleges course. And she'd been working with our students in that course for the last, uh, since January, actually, and we just finished up seven agency showcases, or rather showcases with seven different agencies, college agents, and um, and we're still kind of hearing back from the agents on who they're going to be signing, but it looks like a, a vast majority of the students um, are going to get signed by one of these college agents, and she has kind of helped guide them through this entire process. Um, so Chris Math is an agent assistant at Deggy Entertainment, which is one of the uh, premier uh, college agencies on the market, uh, where she works under Jeff Hyman in the college, festival, and fair market. She works closely with the Deggy roster of artists in the college space in preparation for showcases and conferences, along with her role as the liaison for potential new artist signings. Chris, Math, how's it going? Oh. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Um, it's going well. How are you? I'm doing all right. Um, so I'm curious about how things have been uh, for you the last couple months. And and uh, I and first off, where where are you right now? Where are you coming to us from? I am in Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Okay. How is it for you there? What have you been doing the last couple months? How has it all been going? And and what are your routines looking like? It's been weird, um, as I'm sure everyone else is experiencing in their own unique way. Um, This kind of, we kind of felt the effects of this, I want to say about two weeks before kind of the economy felt the effects of this, especially in the college market. Um, When colleges started calling us and with their concerns over their major college shows, um, and making those, the decisions to cancel those shows or mm-hmm. try and reschedule them. Yeah. Um, that's when we kind of started seeing how, um, large this really was going to yeah. be. Um, so we kind of had a little bit of a jump on things. Um, so it's kind of hit us in waves. Uh, we had that first wave of our major shows, um, kind of being moved or trying to move to the fall. Um, and then we had all of our smaller shows with the artists that we represent um, and trying to reschedule those. What were um, some of the major shows that you had scheduled that had to get moved? Oh, everything from Shade, T-Pain, um, <laughs> you know, 
everything under the sun, um, okay. really. And yeah. then, of course, um, our company also does military shows. So um, a lot of those summer shows are being um, rescheduled now as well. So it's kind of hit us. Um, it really hit college is hard first um, yeah. and month by month, it's just kind of progressing. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but you, you said uh, you kind of got ahead of it. Uh, how, how so, or, or you got to jump on it rather? What, what is, how so, or what does that mean? Yeah, I think colleges were a little more cautious on things. Yeah. Um, you know, they saw it coming and they wanted to get ahead of it. Gotcha. And more as a liability um, than anything. Yeah. And they wanted to protect their students. And when they, this kind of happened right around spring break time. So yeah. making that call while their students were still off campus, instead of having them return to campus just to send them right back home, sure. uh, they were making that decision to extend spring break, even if it was just for one more week in order to, you know, give them a little bit more time to see where this was going. Yeah. Um, they were kind of, you know, taking it a little bit more of a week by week basis um, and then kind of extending things from there. Um, and I remember when we had our agency showcase uh, with, uh, Ari from Deggy, not me, Ari, other Ari. Um, he was talking about how Deggy, uh, you guys have been doing some like virtual concerts as well with some of your artists. How, how have those been working? Yeah, they've been actually working very well. Um, so it started kind of let's try and save whatever we can and transfer whatever shows that we had scheduled into whether we did try and re reschedule um, yeah. for live shows. Granted, that's the ideal situation. Um, yeah. But anything that we could transfer over to a virtual show, we tried to do that. Um, but we did kind of try and fill that void where you still want to have entertainment. You still want to have shows. Yeah. Um, students are still learning from home. Um, yeah. So why not still give them the entertainment and that experience that they would be having on campus anyway. Um, it's not the same. Like we know that um, yeah. it's never going to be the same. Uh, but the least we can do is try and give them some options. So we've been doing some shows online. Um, we have developed kind of a platform um, that we're really proud of uh, through our company and working with a company called FanFX. Um, so one of the great things that we're very proud of is our Friday night live program. And so every Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we have a huge Friday night live concert. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of the artists that we represent at Deggy opening up for some major headliners. Oh, wow. So last week we had um, All American Rejects, Tyson. He was one of the headliners. Cool. <laughs> so tonight we have um, Tyler Farr. So big country. How are these? Uh, that's amazing. How how are these shows working? What platform are you using? And and, and is this on like Facebook or Zoom yeah. or, or where are you hosting these? So we are hosting it on our Facebook page. Um, it is facebook.com slash Deggy Entertainment. It right. is a completely free show. Um, we are streaming it through Zoom, but we work with FanFX, which has created this platform. So you're not just experiencing a Zoom room like we're in right now. You're going to have your kind of custom interface with transition slides, graphics. Um, pretty much we're working to customize it as much or as little as you kind of want to. So we're able to go to schools and say, this is a custom concert experience that you can have. We can work with you and work with your budget, you know, to whatever extent you want. You know, yeah. we can still give you that concert experience. We can make it a private show for just your students. So you can still have your major concert if you want to. You can yeah. have your smaller act concert if you want to. Yeah. Um, we can put your school's logo, your school's colors, your mascot. We can have your president of your school on the screen announcing yeah. the concert. The headline. Oh, wow. I love that. Um, yeah. So it's still trying to customize it for the schools yeah. um, as much as possible and give them as unique of an experience as possible while still being virtual and still being on a screen in front of them. I love that. And, and um, you know, 
I, as, as running Uncanceled Music Festival, the live streaming festival that I launched uh, right uh, with a couple friends of mine, um, right when the quarantine happened, I saw that because all of our, our concerts were actually ticketed and there were tipping capabilities and stuff like that. So this wasn't on Facebook. This wasn't on Instagram where everybody's concerts have been. And it was an interesting experiment for us to run. Would people pay for this? Because we didn't really know, you know, and, and nobody really knows. And, and it's similarly, you're in the position like, will colleges pay for this for their students? <laughs> and it's a little bit different because we were on like a one to one model where like one fan would pay for one ticket and then they get entrance to the show. Whereas uh, you're on like a college pays a bulk amount of money and then they can offer it to all their students kind of a thing model. Right. Right. Um, and like what we found was that fans were willing and are willing to pay for this stuff. Like we had Betty who uh, she performed a, a set at Uncanceled Music Festival and sold a thousand tickets. And it, for like a 40 minute set, a thousand people came in and watched the show just live streaming just like this of her just playing in her room. I'm like, man. And they all bought tickets uh, averaging, I think for her set, it was averaging almost $10 a ticket um, just for that. So like, and you can do the math, not to mention the tips that came in. Like it was actually fairly lucrative too, right. um, but like, yeah, man, if you can really master that and offer that to colleges to give to their students, that's really cool. And I like you mentioned, so you said it was fan effects. Yes. Fan effects. Um, and it's what time on Friday? Seven. Eastern. Yeah. So it's seven o'clock Eastern time um, on Deggy Entertainment, um, cool. our Facebook page. So um, facebook.com slash Deggy Entertainment. Yeah. Um, and it's completely free. Um, it t- it's typically about an hour and a half. Um, we also do a really cool VIP backstage experience after the show as well. Um, so it's the limited number of spots. Um, it gives you an opportunity to have a meet and greet with the headliners. Um, cool. You can submit a question for the headliners and actually get on this into the Zoom room and ask the headliner your question. Wow. Um, it kind of face-to-face per se, (laughs) Um, and really interact with them. You get a virtual meet and greet and get your photo with them um, Mm -hmm. in the Zoom room. So really kind of giving you that that full concert experience um, or as full as we can make it right now. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So cool. Well, thanks, Chris. And yeah, we'll we'll pop a uh, a link to uh, your Facebook page in the chat. Perfect. I will stick it in there. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Um, Nice. All right. So next, I want to bring in um, Allison Toy. And Allison is, uh, so she is one of our instructors for the Breaking China course that we were planning to launch in February. And this is how to break into the Chinese music market. But as you can imagine, uh, (laughs) When, when COVID hit China first and kind of shut down that whole uh, country, we're like, this is probably not the best time to be launching a course on how to break into China. No one wants that right now. And then it, you know, obviously took over the whole world. And, but what's interesting is that they were kind of ahead of all of us. And so there's a lot of data. Um, and when we get to Andrew, I'm going to ask him a bit about the data too. Um, um, that we can look to because they are kind of ahead of the rest of the world in studying all of this. And so, um, so yeah, so we are actually going to launch this Breaking China course in uh, about a month from right now. So just kind of look out for that. And it's uh, really, really cool and interesting. I'm very excited to bring this to everybody. Uh, so Allison Toy is a U.S. and China-based talent manager and culture marketing professional who previously worked for Red Bull 88 Rising, The Fader, CAA, and WME. Toy manages Chinese-American rapper Bohan Phoenix and specializes in East-West crossover. Her past clients for localization strategy include Lauv, M-Theory, Rez, and Flostradamus. And she has facilitated brand partnerships with companies such as Alibaba, Huey, Adidas, Beats by Dre, and more. And currently, she has been working at Twitch, the live streaming app Twitch for the last six weeks. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Allison, how's it going? It's going good, man. I I, I can't complain. In yeah. Beautiful California, not really outside, but uh, yeah. happy to be here and happy to be a part of this. It's great to be here with all of the other um, instructors really kind of for the first time and some of the students that make this place special. So 
thank totally. you thank you and, and everyone here absolutely and, and who's your friend behind you <laughs> oh this is just uh it's just a, an old photo of me in in the uh, club when i used nice. to do that rock yeah. club yeah that's great <laughs> i feel like if i if i stay still you can see my little ears so oh, there you go oh yeah wow you look a lot younger there uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah cool so how's it been going for you what what is your uh how's quarantine been? so you're in you're in the where are you right now san francisco yep yep okay so how has it been the last couple of months since quarantine started and have your routine shifted and and i guess you started this new job what's it all been like yeah you know i definitely the routine has shifted i'm i'm kind of a busy body i also dj on the side so i'm used to sort of being out and about quite a lot and um you know quite honestly quarantine for me was definitely an adjustment. Um, but I feel really lucky for the support that I have around me. You know, I have my family nearby and in town and everything. And also a lot of my friends in the area um, are, you know, co community organizers in and of their own right. You know, we've put together like a nightly Zoom festival that runs every, every evening, 7 to 9 p.m. It's kind of like a little variety turn up show. You got people doing yoga, you got people doing wow. DJ sets, you've got people talking about, you know, hand washing best practices like everything Where and so the, people, how can we watch it that's yeah cool. here i will pop the instagram link in the chat so, okay, right cool. here it's called inside lands we are so named after outside lands the popular music festival that usually happens in august here in the bay area put on mm -hmm. by another planet entertainment um cool. and yeah so that has definitely been keeping me sane i think the biggest adjustment for me has just been finding new ways to connect with my community and be social and, um, you know, just have a place that I can go to a safe little space with all my friends um, every night if I want to. So for me, like, I think it's been really, um, you know, it's been challenging for sure, but also really positive in that it's been an opportunity for me to think about different ways of connecting with friends and community that I probably wouldn't have considered mm. in, in the past. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, man, I'm definitely going to check out the, uh, the little nightly festival that you have. That sounds amazing. Come through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, oh, I saw you wrote in the chat, the clubs, clubs are already open in China. Yes, sir. Is, um, uh, it, it depends city by city and everything, but, um, wow. yeah, like all my DJ and promoter friends in Shanghai are already back up and working. It's mm -hmm. slower traffic than, you know, it has been in the past. People are quite cautious. Sure. Pretty much everyone is wearing masks, but, I'm really happy to find that all the DJs are getting booked again and clubs are reopening. So it actually looks quite positive there. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, it's kind of like they, you know, they're a, they're a month or two ahead of the rest of the world. So I guess that's a bit encouraging to know that clubs could potentially open up. We, you know, everyone is, is kind of hypothesized, but it's, it's, you know, probably going to be a 50% attendance rate at least kind of went because because people will be concerned and cautious and sure. masks will probably be required or, or recommended going to um, do it. But that's cool. And so um, uh, so you started a job at Twitch. Yes, sir. And you started remotely, obviously. Uh, how, well, for one, how is it to start a new job? remotely without like being working with anybody and you're just like yeah how does that work you know it's it's definitely weird i think for me maybe as compared to others it was less of an adjustment because i've been really used to working all over the world in weird hours in random places cafes apartments like yeah. whatever it is um i think anybody that is sort of like a a creative or a freelancer um is maybe a little bit more used to that flexibility rather than like the folks that go to an office every day and are super yeah. used to that. Cool. So all things considered, um, it's actually been a much sort of smoother integration than I anticipated. But I also think that has a lot to do with the fact that Twitch is very much a tech company as well too. So in, in the way of like getting people onboarded and streamlining that process, like they were surprisingly buttoned up. So yeah. I'm, I've been pleasantly surprised to be honest. That's awesome. So that's great. And, and you know, Twitch, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a live stream, very popular uh, live streaming app. It's been around for, how long has it been around for? Um, you know, Twitch actually started over 10 years ago. Um, wow. okay. And it actually started as uh, this, our, our founder's name is Justin Khan, and it started as Justin TV, where dude was just streaming his life 
like his mundane everyday life for a really long time. Yeah. And then somehow gamers sort of like got wind of the platform and really sort of took it over. And then it eventually became Twitch sort of as we know it today, where the roots of it really are very much in, in the gaming and esports space. Yeah. That's right. So I, I think, you know, most people know Twitch as the app where you can watch people play video games in real time and comment and tip them and even like subscribe to them for a few bucks a month or something like that. Um, I think it's, don't you have a partnership with Amazon now? Amazon yeah, Prime. so um, Twitch is actually owned by Amazon. Amazon oh. is the parent company. Gotcha. Um, and so if you do link your Amazon Prime account with your Twitch account, you get like special offerings, you get free subscriptions. So cool. yeah, there is, cool. there's definitely a relationship there. Interesting. And, and there are, I mean, creators that are making money on Twitch and some of them are making like a lot of money. I know from like subscriptions and the tips and all of that stuff. Um, is it, are musicians starting to use Twitch? Are there musicians on Twitch or people like actually playing shows and that kind of stuff on Twitch? Absolutely. So I, you know, I think Twitch has definitely had a reputation of being like a gaming platform, but in reality, it really is a live streaming platform. And mm. there are so many different kinds of people, whether they're musicians or they're chefs or they're dance instructors who are making full-time living streaming on Twitch. Right? Wow. So there's so many different types of people on there. I can say for the music category, we've seen maybe about 500% growth in the last six weeks. Mm. Um, so there's definitely been a huge amount of new people getting up and streaming but also a huge amount of viewers who yeah. are coming and checking out live content on twitch kind of for the first time mm. so it's actually a really exciting space right now um you know there's definitely a very large community of, of sort of like twitch native artists who kind of like built their careers on the platform and have been using it for for many years yeah. and it's interesting to see sort of them actually sharing their chops and their, their best practices with like the more established artists that are coming from off platform and like really learning from them. So cool. it's, it's actually a really cool time right now to, to sort of be on Twitch and watching what's happening there. That's awesome. That's amazing. And, and I've been like trying to explore all the various live streaming possibilities out there. What I like about Twitch over kind of a Facebook or an Instagram is that um, engagement and the tipping and kind of it's gamified the whole platform is and um, the interactiveness between everybody and the chat box and, and it's yeah it feels it feels like I'm playing a video game when I'm like watching a, a stream of something it's kind of cool um, right yeah. well Allison thank you so much um, that's that's super great and, and helpful um, we will I will uh, bring you back in just a, a second for sure um, cool all right. So our final um, instructor, uh, guest speaker today is Andrew Spalter. He is the other instructor for a Breaking China course, uh, which we're launching in a month. Um, his bio, even the US and UK's most popular artists have no idea what the social media and music streaming landscape looks like in China or its importance in the journey of taking an artist's career to the next level. Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Spotify are some of the top platforms in the U.S. used as the foundation for all brands, but they are all banned in China. So what's next? That's where the East Coast Global team comes in. East Coast Global develops brands in an untapped market in the East. They establish, deliver, and execute predetermined game plans and launch brands in China with their client list currently including Will Smith, Youngblood, Bobby Burke, Claro, Jesse J, DJ Snake, and more. Developed by Jesse J's former tour manager, Andrew Spalter, at just age 26, Spalter and East Coast Global are showing artists and managers how to think and brand globally. Andrew Spalter, welcome. What's going Hi. on? Hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, hey. How's it going? Where are you coming to us from? Uh, Los Angeles. All right. We got, yeah. Just down the road, where there's a few of us in, in LA that we, we can't quite high five just yet, but we're getting close to that point. Exactly. <laughs> air hugs. Yeah, air hugs. Um, so how has it been going for you the last couple months, um, just in, in terms of like what you've been able to work on during quarantine? How has your business been, East Coast Global? How sure. has social media landscape in China been looking like? Yeah, how's all that been for you? What's it look um, like? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. What's up, everyone? Great to be on with 67 other people. Um, I think, you know, first and foremost, it's definitely affecting our business, both in good and bad ways. Um, 
I'll start with the bad, then get to the good. The, the, but everything's a bit, it's interesting. So we were a marketing company. We're a management company specifically for digital platforms. So imagine you hire a social media manager for your Instagram. We do that, but for Chinese platforms. Um, imagine you hire a Spotify playlisting team. We do the same thing, but for Chinese platforms. So we're a combination of the two. Just so overview, we help build, you know, artists, influencers, brands, et cetera, in China. Um, with that said, I mean, the bio kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, we are super used to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, Reddit, uh, Netflix, so many different platforms that, yeah there's a barrier to entry in China simply because they just, it's up with a firewall, right? So you can't access those platforms and therefore the country of China and the residents of China have all established these platforms that not necessarily mimic certain platforms. TikTok and Doyen are one and the same because they're owned by the same parent company. Right. Um, but it's, it's a bit broken off. You can't access all those platforms that I listed from China. Um, so with that said, people on the ground here, they have a bit of a hard time understanding that and obviously realizing that there are platforms that are very active out there with hundreds of millions of users. Uh, right. The way that it's affected business, you know, we charge uh, our corporate structures monthly retainers, right? So, and currently the entire music industry hat for touring musicians has to take a break for, a lot of artists that are in the electronic space and hip hop space, um, primarily artists, you know, not necessarily producers, but artists that are touring, a majority of their revenue stream is, you know, has pretty much ceased to exist. Um, so with that said, we've definitely had a handful of clients pause services simply because they don't have a lot of money coming in from tour. Um, they have no money coming in from touring. They have very little money coming in from streaming, just dependent on who the client is, to be completely frank. Um, where it is good, it makes, you know, in the bad comes good, it makes me and our team understand um, where artists are really making money right now and helps us understand what the needs of our clients are. Mm -hmm. um, it also, you know, we're all working remotely and we learn that we can work super well remotely. So, you know, an expense that's quite a large expense each, each month with our office space and talking with my landlord about breaking the lease early. And it's just like little things that are all, we're just trying to make light of all the darkness, I guess, mm -hmm. and really trying to take in everything, every client who's pausing, every situation that we're running into throughout this process, that, as I imagine, you know, the 60 other people on this call are, um, just trying to make light of every situation and trying to remain positive through it all. Um, how yeah. is it going in? What have you been seeing um, when when China was in quarantine? Um, how that uh, affected social media? Did, did usage go up? Did it go down? Yeah, so that's a great question. So usage, followers, engagement, streaming skyrocketed. Really? You know, but this was between two to four months ago as opposed to now when we're in quarantine, everyone, you know, I think Vo said it best. It's like people are sitting on Hulu. People are sitting on Netflix. People are listening, watching, et cetera. They're consuming digital media. And yeah. in China that all happened, you know, two to four months ago and really it started to open up their country within the last month yeah. um, to people going back into work, people going back to restaurants. Like um, Allison said, you know, we, we probably have a, a quite a handful of mutual friends that are in Shanghai going to clubs right now. Like, wow. you know, we have, uh, uh, Allison, I know, you know, loose, but it's like, these people are like, literally some of our friends are DJing these clubs this weekend. Wow. You know, so it's just, it, it's interesting to see in, um, but yeah. And I mean, that, that's kind of it. Business, you know, engagement has been influenced over the past few months. It's definitely still riding that wave quite a bit. Um, we have had a lot of new clients jump on board recently just because they understand, okay, now I have to focus on digital. I have to focus on streaming. Right. I can't focus on touring. So what do I do? Right. right? I need to make my name as big as possible. And, and l luckily we, you know, we've had some pretty great um, clients that, we hope to work with for years to come that recognize that in that. Yeah. Understand that. Um, and I think, you know, the biggest thing for us is to instill in a lot of people that Spotify is, you know, because you get new 
on New Music Friday because you get onto, um, you know, the Daily Lift playlist or, you know, what's buzzing or uh, the Apple Music, the Beats One, et cetera. That's a select market. You know, nine times out of 10, you're on New Music Friday here, but you might, might not be in the 60 to 90 other countries that Spotify is on. Yeah, right. Um, and sure. with that said, let's say that you're just on here. It has about 3 million followers. It's 0.00003% of the world's population. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, which is great because a lot of developing artists, uh, demographics and their market is, you know, the America. Yeah. They need to build a footprint here before they can get out into the world. And But we just like to kind of implore to people that the world is bigger than you know, you think it is. Right. And I, I think like you shared an interesting stat with me. Um, like when we were first developing the China course, it was like, you know, what, 250 million Spotify users and like how many users are on the streaming services in China? Yeah. they So the Chinese services, um, they say that they have NetEase music is, it's pretty, it's the younger platform. It's fairly newer. It's like the Spotify of China that has about 600 million users. Okay. Like QQ, which is owned by Tencent, which is on, you know, trading on the stock exchange, Tencent Music Entertainment. They bought a big portion of Universal. They own a portion of Spotify. Um, those guys, they have a platform called QQ with 800 million users. So we have 800 million users on one streaming platform, 600 million users on another platform. And we're all obsessed with Spotify with their 200, 250 million users, you know. And that's yeah, and I just, and I want to make a disclaimer. They, they the channels claim to have these amount of users at the end of the day, who the hell knows? Um, sure. Because that's quite a large number. But with that said, yes, that, you know, we're obviously, you know, everyone's super in the music industry, super focused on Spotify simply because it's available in, you know, yeah. 90 plus countries. Yeah. Um, whereas QQ music and NetEase music are used primarily. And I'll write those here. Yeah. Um, and so I've, those platforms are used primarily in China and right. for people, Chinese citizens that live elsewhere. Did you get any um, data or stats or anything where streaming uh, went up or down on NetEase or QQ uh, over the last few months during quarantine? I did not, okay. unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Well, right on. Andrew, thank you so much for that. And uh, super interesting. And uh, do you mind if I answer a question really quick? So. So yeah. Axel, um, Q, yeah, that's a really good question. So I, I imagine you guys are thinking about revenue and royalties, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, per million streams on Spotify, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's between like four to 6,000 US dollars you get it's, per it's million. It's a bit less than that. It's, it's uh, okay. per million streams, it's around three to 4,000. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's compared to these Chinese platforms. Um, from what you know, our partners at these DSP platforms tell me, they say, you know, Andrew, uh, piracy, you know, China just came out of piracy three to four to five years ago. Right. Um, and somewhere between that window, people started to get paid for their streams. And with that said, I think the opportunity there is large because, um, you know, streaming, no one was getting paid a few years ago. And now people, I believe the last report that I saw was between a hundred to 300 us dollars per million streams, which okay. is frankly not a lot, obviously. Um, but at the end of the day, we have some clients that come to us with a billion streams and they're like, Hey, I heard my songs big. And we look into it and we're like, Holy shit, you have a billion streams. Yeah. Well, and if you think about it, it makes sense because it's like, okay, sure. It's not really apples to apples when you're comparing it because Sure, Spotify pays you know three to four thousand dollars per yeah. stream. There's only two hundred fifty million users there. When you're looking at eight hundred million users, um, that's two, four, six, eight, almost four times more users than Spotify. So it is paying less, but you're theoretically getting more streams. Technically, like I went into my NetEase or not, right when we did that, yeah. I didn't have a NetEase account, but I like just looked up my um, artist's uh, name on NetEase. And sure enough, I had streams, I had comments, I had people doing it. And I started looking up friends bands. I'm like, wow, there's actually people listening to the, all these American artists that probably have no idea. Right. Uh, have a, a friend, um, Andrew Lee, he's a manager of a band. 
And uh, he got hit up by a, a Chinese promoter um, not too long ago saying, hey, uh, your band is, is massive in China. Are you planning to tour here? And this band had actually broken up four years prior. And yeah. so Andrew's like, uh, <laughs> wait, really? And so he like texts the band. He's like, yo, you guys want to uh, go to like get back together? Here's an interesting offer. But like, would you consider getting back together for one tour, just a tour into China? And every, the texts start coming back. And they're like, yep, yep, yep. Sounds yeah. good. We'd love to. Let's do it. Let's do it. And they booked an entire China tour, seven cities, because they were massive in China. And they didn't realize it. Yeah. You know, the music got uploaded in that East because it's user generated until they claim it. And so they you know, weren't earning from it because it's. Different. It happens often. It's, re- it's a really interesting landscape. And, the, yeah. and, it's, and, and at the end of the day, you never know um, until you kind of look. Yeah, you know, and, and oh, I'm gonna, I'll leave our website in the cool, great, the chat. And thanks, for, thanks again, guys. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Cool. So um, I'm gonna um, unmute all the instructors and feel free uh, or to unmute yourself. I guess, guys. I, I don't know if I can do that since you're now a co-host. Um, and um, I am going to just kind of open up the table uh, for discussion for a little bit, and then we'll bring in questions. In, in the meantime, if anybody here has a question, please click the raise hand button, and uh, and I will call on you, and then we'll unmute you, um, and you can bring in a question. So if anybody has a question for any of the instructors, uh, click that raise hand button. And again, I want to keep it on topic of kind of what we're discussing here today, and not maybe your specific um questions that you might have about whatever course you're in. And so if you do have a question, please click that raise hand button. Um, so um, what I'm, uh, I'm curious and, and feel free to kind of jump in anybody uh, is where do you see, what do you, what do you see changing in the music industry kind of after COVID after we're quote unquote back to normal, whenever that will be, do you see anything permanently changing or shifting or evolving and what that, what that looks like? So I don't, whoever feels comfortable, Allison, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, this, is, this is something that we, I've been thinking a lot about at work specifically, um, which is, you know, the big elephant in the room for us as we're experiencing a huge amount of growth is, is this going to sustain when the world goes back to normal, whatever right. that looks like. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that question is like only only what the Lord knows at this point. But what I will say is that, um, you know, one thing that I'm finding really interesting and I wonder how this will be institutionalized with brands or with media and whatnot, is that what I feel is the way that people are kind of like qualified, like the way people are measuring success of an event is different from what it was before. Like it is so much more about quality, community and connection over quantity Mm -hmm. such that like, you know, I could be streaming a DJ set on Twitch. If I have a thousand followers and nobody's actually talking to me and like having conversation and stuff, it's, you know, it's cool and everything, but that is nowhere near as big of a win as if I have 30 people watching my set and everyone's having a great time and we're chatting and we're sharing edits and all sorts of stuff like that. So, um, you know, I think like having people for a long time, like basically consume digital events because they have no other choice. Um, I really wonder like how that's going to change how people interact with events IRL in the future and, you know, will, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I, it's interesting because it, I I think it almost (laughs) is like a necessary reset for all of us as in just what is the value proposition for us and how do we, uh, what is most valuable to us in our lives? Is it numbers on a phone screen or is it real connection with other humans? And I think like we got so obsessed with the numbers on a screen saying, I need more of these numbers right here. When like, when you think about that, it's like, that's absurd. Like we're obsessing over numbers. What does that even mean? Why are we obsessing over numbers? Well, you make a good point. It's like when you're doing stuff like this and you're interacting and maybe like we saw with the Uncanceled Music Festival, you know, some shows had 12 people in there watching the shows, uh, but the connection was real. Like the, the artist was interacting with those 12 um, attendees and they were chatting and they were having such a great time 
that 12, when you think of like, oh, only 12 people, you know, were uh, tuned into the thing or like are following me or whatever. It's like, those are 12 human deeds. Those are 12 individual souls. Those are people that you now are affecting and they're affecting you. And this is a real connection. So I really love that, uh, that maybe, you know, it gets us all to reset of the value proposition. Cool. Um, any other thoughts from any, uh, any I think on a, an addition to that, that I really like, I think I mentioned it on our last Q and a, I've been one of my daily commitments is to respond to every fan in the last 24 hours, wow. for the last two weeks. And it's been really challenging, but it's also been really rewarding. And I've noticed that a lot of, I've one, I've gotten a lot out of it personally. I've enjoyed connecting and being like, wow, this guy is a human. Check out his profile. He really is a fan of me. Like this wow. is like, it's so easy to just see a comment or a like and just be like, oh, not enough. Oh, hold on. Not enough. You know, but checking them out. Wow. And they're a human. And I've been, um, I've been enjoying connecting so that her, uh, just the comment on quality and connection. That's, that's so true. Yeah. And it reminds me of the last tour I did, which is my first tour. Uh, my smallest show in Toronto, though, I had 25 people in the audience, maybe like 18 of them were VIP. Uh, like it was my, it was the most connected, incredible experience I've ever had because wow. I could literally, it was like talking to them one on one and they were really there with me versus LA, which had 160. I felt nothing compared to my Toronto show in terms of emotional connection. Yeah. And so developing like, what, how are we gauging that success as an artist? And also on an individual level, I think people are going to come out of this reprioritizing just what's important to them in their life and how they're spending their time. A lot of people go out for a beer Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mindlessly not thinking. Now they can't do that. Like really reanalyzing how am I spending my time? Once this is out, I really like the beach. Yeah. I didn't go to the beach. Now I really <laughs> want to go to the beach. You know, just small things like that. We're just reassessing our, our life. Yeah. You know, so way outside of music and a brand perspective, how are we spending our time as humans here? Yeah. And I feel very different about how I did before the pandemic. I like going to get the fucking mail. I like <laughs> I mean, I, I, that. <laughs> I know I check my mail like three times a day. Like, <laughs> I know I already got it today, but like, I'm just going to check one more time in case. Yeah. The <laughs> yeah. That's, so true. That's so true. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I think on my side of things, uh, I don't know. Am, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, bro. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, for some reason, I'm not picking your up audio deep, on my head. Your cinematic headphones. voice is coming through beautifully. Right. Yo, yo, what up? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Next Sunday. Yeah, um, yeah I, think, I think as far as uh, sync uh, is concerned, yeah. um, I think, you know, right now what we're witnessing is a huge opportunity uh, because of, you know, again, all of the ads that are, that are happening. I, and, and again, I don't want to seem insensitive to, to what's happening with people. This pandemic is obviously something that's, super devastating we're all we're all worried about our fan our uh, friends our family um you know and um so i don't want to diminish the 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 weight of what's happening in the world today uh, but just to kind of keep things on topic and and focused on the industry specifically um i think it is an opportunity we're seeing we're seeing that the numbers don't lie um, it's, it's been absolutely crazy. Uh, a lot of advertising companies and, and even, you know, production companies, film companies are advertising to you because you're online all day. Um, so it's a huge boom. But then what I think, what I think is going to happen after this, um, and this is just based on, you know, some of my experience actually working as a composer on television shows, um, you know, seeing certain things happen that kind of can halt production. And then we got to send you a rerun, you know? Um, I think we're going to experience another boom. So we're going to have two separate booms. We're going to have we're going to have the the COVID ad boom that we're experiencing right now, and then after this, all of those companies that that had to go into hiatus, they're going to go into overdrive, and you're going to see a lot more shows being produced, a lot more films being produced, and they're not going to take their time. They're going to go crazy. So <laughs> we're going to see when it opens back up. All of those people who um, who couldn't who who are waiting for things to open up now, um, it's just going to go into into overdrive, and uh, I think we're going to experience another huge huge wave uh, via that as well. So um, mm -hmm. a lot of things a lot of things are are happening. Again, this is all speculation. I'm optimistic, but I know that 
I know that um, I know that when business reopens, that they're they're unlikely to miss the opportunity to to take advantage of the fact that they can go back into production. They're they're more likely to just go absolutely nuts. Yeah. Uh, and coupled with that, the way that budgets work uh, with production is that the more time a production is uh, in process, even if it's in hiatus, I, I'm I, I guess I'm I'm sure a lot of people have lost their jobs, unfortunately. Uh, but um, something that's in production, the more th- every single day you're spending money. So if it's if something has been delayed, you're spending more and more and more money. Every day costs money. So now these productions are losing money. Yes. Uh, so they want to come back hard, and they're losing money. And what does that mean for you and myself, right? Because I, I mean, I, unless Diddy is on this conversation, or like the weekend is on this conversation, right? right. I, I consider myself an unknown artist. I'm, I'm more business to business. Uh, I'm not a huge household name to like your nieces and nephews. I'm I'm more known behind the scenes, mm-hmm. right? Um, so in that effect, it, you know my my presence to the public is just like it is to all of yours, uh, right? Uh, And I think that what that means for us is that when these companies come back, we experience this huge wave. uh, they're, They're producing more, so they need more music. Budgets are lower because they've lost so much money. They're not going to be spending money on the weekend, Kendrick. They're going to be coming to me. They're going to be coming yeah. to you. So whereas you, I mean, you, you never, you never really, uh, it never really um, was a barrier of entry that you don't have a massive name in sync anyways, even pre-COVID. I mean, you can, you know, I've, I have a, I have a pretty, I love my career and I, nobody knows who I am, right? Um, so it never was a barrier of entry, but I think now even more so because those budgets won't, are shrinking every single day. Uh, that they're going to be looking for your music uh, because, you know, and that's not to say that you're going to get really, really small fees. Your, right. your, your industry standard fee is a small fee, right? right. I'm talking like, I, you know, I, so we had a trailer with Led Zeppelin uh, coming out for a film a couple years ago. And um, I'm sorry, let me back that up. They wanted, they, they loved the Led Zeppelin song uh, for this trailer and they wanted to do an updated hip hop version of it. So it was basically kind of like, it was a remix slash cover, right? Um, had my vocal on it, new production, but then it also had uh, the original uh, vocal as well in there. So it's this hybrid thing. Um, to give you an idea of what I mean in terms of budget, Led Zeppelin got a, I don't even know if I should give the specifics of this. This is kind of like, yeah, I'll just say this. Led Zeppelin got a, a massive six-figure uh, uh, deposit into escrow just to watch the trailer to see if they wanted to be a part of it. And oh, if they, yeah, yeah, massive six-figure, yeah. like deep into six figures, right? Um, just to watch it, to see with our stuff on it, with our take on it, without their contribution, their notes or anything like that. We just took their track. We did a remix of it, put my vocals on it, and... Uh, they wanted that money in escrow to watch it to say, okay, we like this. Now let's negotiate a sync fee for you to be able to use it. So, oh, wow. so this is they. You had to you had to drop six figures to negotiate how how much you were going to pay them. Right. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. that's what I mean in terms of you know. And for me, if I even got a hundred grand for that, that's pretty standard for a no name artist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, hundred cool. grand all in, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's so. really encouraging um, to, for the indie artists is that uh, even though budgets might be smaller, that's actually going to help the indie artists because like we would be thrilled with a hundred thousand dollar trailer placement. Whereas Absolutely. like you can't even get in, you can't even get on the phone with Led Zeppelin for a hundred thousand so dollars. No, like, <laughs> it costs a hundred thousand dollars to get on the phone. So right. what I'm, what, so when I'm saying that, so what, so the, the whole point of all that is that, um, uh, that now the budgets are shrinking. So now it's more attractive to use, uh, unhurt, um, uh, underdeveloped, underestablished artists because you can get them for cheaper, essentially. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, you brought a point, like, we're not going to, um, people aren't going to miss this moment when we come back. And it's like, I think a lot of people, even especially outside the industry, uh, took things, took entertainment for granted, uh, took took musicians and music for granted. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people who are, who've been like putting off going to see live music as in like, ah, get to that. But that's cool. I might go, "Ah, that's not a big deal. They're coming back around. And then once all of this has been ripped away from everybody, it's like, Oh, 
we can't actually go. And it's actually, I don't want to live in a world where there is no live music. And so I'm expecting once we can kind of get back into it, that sure, until there's a vaccine, we're going to see lower attendance and people are going to be cautious and that's fine. But once we're in a year or whenever that happens, when we're really, truly back to normal, I anticipate attendance just skyrocketing. And probably in two to three years, I would, I would put money down that oh, the yeah. live music market is going to have the biggest year it's ever had in two years globally, live music, because people are going to be so hungry for live music <laughs> once yeah. they're fully vaccinated. <laughs> uh, they'll be so <laughs> hungry for live music that it's really going to come back. So we're like in this weird transition period right now, but it's a great time. We're artists. That's the most beautiful thing right now is just like artists sometimes need hibernation points. And like, whereas people like I've had good friends who had massive tours canceled this year. They were going to going on the biggest tours of their life, huge opening slots playing in front of thousands of people a night. It was a bummer. Yes. That their tours got canceled. Um, but you know, it's now I'm talking to, I just, I had a call uh, with one of them uh, yesterday, a catch up FaceTime call, see how she's doing. And she's creating some of the most innovative, cool music of her entire life and career and stuff that she has never thought to create. And she's developing her own home studio. She's now learning to, she's usually typically worked with producers. She's now learning to produce her own music. She set up a whole home studio, like video studio to make videos on. And it's like really inspiring to hear that as in like, and you know, we're now as artists, getting a bit more introverted, introspective, and this is kind of our our time to create. So when we are allowed to share that publicly in person, I think it's going to burst out of all the artists that we have. There's going to be some incredible music that's going to come out of this period, and that's up to everybody on this call today to do. But also, I think on the fan perspective, people are going to crave live music so much more, and tours are going to skyrocket all over the world, and I think it's going to be a really beautiful time. Um, so cool. Uh, any other thoughts from any of the, uh, instructors that you wanted to mention anything? Um, I want to, I want to say something that's a bit, um, funny, kind of touching to what I spoke to about China, um, earlier. Yeah. And Allison can definitely attest to this, but someone reached out to me privately in the chat and said, Hey, do you mind looking up this artist? Um, seeing how they're doing in China. And sure enough, I look them up and their top song on their NetEase channel has 39,000 comments, which probably (laughs) equates to like 100 million streams. Wow. Who's the artist? Yeah, what song? Um, Let me see. Let me get back to this link. It's a song called... Colorblind, released in 2014. By who? By an artist named Matt B. Matt B. How do you spell Matt B? Shout out Matt, M-A-T-T space B. Cool. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, (laughs) It's just funny. It just goes to show. It's like you never know what's going on in that side of the world. Um, Wow. You know, if you're, so I'm going to, I'm going to actually write out for those who work with artists um, and you would like to Jeez. That's kind of crazy. Up. I'm not even seeing Matt B on Spotify. Uh, but Matt I is Ace B. B is yeah, he has uh, YouTube stuff and his, and his stuff like that. And Search bar is kind of on that. Right. Uh, cool. So that's the link to Nettie's music. And just, you know, for everyone that works with artists, feel free to even though the site's obviously in Mandarin and Chinese, there is a search bar. It's very easy to identify in the top right. You can go through all of that uh, in the in the Chinese yeah. in China course. So in the Breaking China course, like Andrew and Allison kind of break all of this down and show you not only how to find your artists and stuff like that, um, and we're going to kind of how to uh, actually claim your profiles, get your music in there if it's not in there, and grow it that way. So like yeah. that's popping right now. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, um, and, awesome. and I do just want to quickly flag before I jump off. Um, a lot of distribution platforms like DistroKid, TuneCore, et cetera, they recently started distributing to 
um, these channels in, yep. in China and Korea and whatnot. So if you do look for your artist name, if you do look for people you're working with, et cetera, yep. it, you know, old releases may or may not be there. Um, don't be worried. It's just about with the distributor. So I highly recommend that everyone checks in with them and cool. see who's, you know, but that's Man. it for me. That's cool. Yeah. Matt B, I just found him on Spotify. Thanks for that link. So he has like a total of maybe a million total streams on Spotify. And you're saying in, in China, he's got maybe a hundred million streams and he's only, this guy's got like 80,000 monthly listeners, which is very, yeah. um, it happens. It, yeah. I've seen it happen a million times with people. Pretty crazy. Pretty yeah. crazy. Cool. Well, I want to uh, just thank everybody for, for coming in and, and thank you to the instructors, uh, Bo, Chris, Allison, Lucid, Andrew. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this. This is super helpful, hopefully very inspiring Absolutely. for all the, uh, the students that were on today. Um, and uh, this is, uh, um, you know, we're, we're going to do more of these kinds of things. Um, I also wanted to kind of introduce Allison and Andrew to the Ari Steak Academy community because we'll be launching that Breaking China course and, uh, and just kind of bring the community together. It was fun for me to go into the grid view and see everybody's faces and see someone from last year's China course. Uh, I mean, sorry, last year's college course. Um, and it's Veronica, what's up? And to see people from all the various courses from the streaming one to the touring to uh, the sync course, uh, everybody in, in the college course this year, cracking colleges, everybody um, from all over the world. And so it was, it was cool to, uh, to see everybody there and to be a part of this. So right on and uh, have a great rest of your day, your weekend, your week, your month, and we will see you in the Facebook groups. Take care, everyone.